And I, I'm really pleased to introduce our moderator for the next session, which is all about the startups. So uh, Alan Kohler would be known to many of you, I'm sure, for the numerous roles that he's undertaken across business and finance journalism and analysis. Uh, he's been a financial journalist for 46 years, which seems a phenomenal amount of time, um, starting as a cadet on The Australian. And he's been editor for both the Australian Financial Review, The Age newspapers, and in 1995 joined the ABC, first as a reporter on the 7.30 report, then as host as Inside Business, and then finance presenter on the ABC News, where I think you'll see him pretty much every day um, talking about what's going on in markets. Um, he's also currently publisher and editor of his own, 100% owned publication, The Constant Investor, and business editor at large of The Australian, and presenter of Talking Business Channel on Qantas. Um, and adjunct professor at the Business Faculty of Victoria University. That's a full agenda, I might add. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming Alan and our next session, Here Come the Startups. Hello, everyone. Thanks. Thanks very much for that very kind introduction. Now, um, yes, I'm 110. Um, um, so uh, we have a great panel today, starting with... Uh, Dr. Katina Michael, who's sitting down, a professor at the School of Computing and Information Technology in the University of Wollongong. Uh, next to her is uh, Jessica Ellerm, who's the CEO and co-founder of Zupa Superannuation, um, and Phil Livingston, who's the founder and managing director of Redback Technologies. Now, the, the session today is kind of a, a broader look at in innovation, with some focus on um, on uh, energy, obviously, but uh, but uh, you know, uh, fitting it into the context of um, of innovation generally. Um, I've been asked to say a few words by way of introduction, which I'll do, and then we'll turn to each of our panelists to both introduce themselves and to say a couple of words themselves. Then we'll have a uh, moderated Q&A, which will involve you. Um, and uh, we're starting a bit late, so we'll probably go a bit late. Um, so look, uh, uh, the, I suppose the thing to, to note is that everything is being disrupted at the moment. We're going through what you might call a mass disruption. Uh, transport is being electrified, energy is being defossilised and democratised, banking and currency is being digitised, phones are no longer used for talking on, uh, but for typing on and talking at and taking pictures and playing games and all that stuff, so the phones have become an amazing, um, you know, sort of ubiquitous device, dozens of ways to communicate with everyone around the world, um, which is an amazing development. And we've got artificial intelligence, machine learning, blockchain, we've got drones, we've got augmented reality, virtual reality, 3D printing, and soon uh, to have quantum computing, which is apparently going to change everything again. So uh, it's getting a bit hard for Grandpa to keep up, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, um, public discourse has been lobotomized, and I and I use that term in the sense of carving out a portion of the brain, because uh, uh, whereas you know often there's discussions about innovation and politicians always talk about innovation, except this the big part of innovation, which is energy, has kind of been removed from the discussion uh, and moved into a kind of political place, so it can't be a proper discussion anymore. And so the politics and much of the media have retreated into a sort of a cartoon world uh, of goodies and baddies. Possibly because everything's too complicated for them or maybe it's too complicated for everybody in a way um, and that the simplicity of slogans and conflict is more appealing and more powerful. So Andy Vizi of AGL said yesterday, the, this debate, the lack of clarity, the sense of uncertainty is literally caused by caused by disruption. And that disruption is caused by the fact that technology has changed and our social systems have not changed as fast, which I thought was an interesting insight. Um, now, I don't want to go on too much about politics. As uh, Josh Frydenberg said yesterday, it's kind of become irrelevant because renewable energy is becoming, and probably has become, pretty much cheaper than fossil fuel energy, thanks to the form of Moore's law that applies here. Uh, but he was using it as a way out of uh, making a decision on the clean energy target. Um, you know, the CET, I just, just by way of kind of my view on that, is that the CET is, was put forward by Alan Finkel as a, a compromise mechanism, but actually the politicians don't want compromise. They want to have a conflict 
and they want to use energy. Now, it was very interesting, Tony Abbott's speech last night in London, where he said um, uh, that, I'm just trying to remember exactly what he said, when we used, when we used uh, energy or carbon, uh, carbon emissions as, as a point of conflict, uh, we gained 25 net seats. And when we didn't do that, we lost 14 seats. That was in his speech in London. Now, I, I, have, I actually don't know whether that's true. I hope it's not true. I think I hope it's bullshit, but uh, I just um, I just don't know. I'll need to check it out. Um, but the but the relevance of politics to our discussion today is, uh, in a way, as a counterpoint to innovation, the opposite of innovation, as it were. Um, just just finally, I, I actually for, for one of the things I do for the Constant Investor, which is my new product, is that I interview a CEO every day. Um, uh, sometimes I do several a day just to get a, get them in the bank. Yesterday I did. Yesterday I did a bloke who is disrupting the funeral industry with a with a sort of an Uber model where where the. Um, <laughs> don't laugh. It's true. The um, and the celebrants, the funeral celebrants, are the Uber drivers of his model. It's fantastic. Um, there was another, uh, uh, this is yesterday, right? This is just yesterday. So there was that bloke. Uh, there's another one who's an Australian company based in, Australian company based in Philadelphia uh, that's developing an acne cream made from cannabis, which uh, is great. It works, actually. Uh, and the other one yesterday was a business that finances, called Silver Chef, it's Silver, Silver Chef, it's been around for a while, that finances coffee machines and pizza ovens using uh, an innovative lending model uh, that they kind of invented themselves. So in a, I innovation can take many forms. It's just a way, to, a way to lend is one form of innovation. Last week, there was a disruptive asthma measuring device, a new payments platform, a lithium miner, and Spark Infrastructure, which is really interesting business. They own all the poles and wires, power core, city core here, Transgrid in New South Wales. And what they're on about, they're all about connecting solar farms and wind farms to the grid now. Um, so uh, maybe Phil can tell us about that. Um, anyway, I'm having the time of my life at the moment. <laughs> Interviewing all these people, they're great. Um, and I'm looking forward to today's panellists. So perhaps... Um, we can uh, get going and Katina, maybe you'd like to kick off with uh, a few minutes of your own. Um, I can do that. Uh, do you mind if I stand up because I can't see the audience on the left hand side, is that okay? Sure. Alan had a great segue into all the technologies uh, that are coming to the fore. It's innovation galore, it's appetite eternally, it's think on your feet, dream about it, create, and if you've got some stealth behind you, go for it. Now, if we look at it in the energy sector, it's empowering to consumers in particular because we now all have access to dashboards. We have access to information like never before. We know how much we're using. And perhaps some of us even becoming addicted to these apps in viewing these decisions. But from what I see in peer-reviewed outlets of publications, we soon tire of the dashboard or we tire of becoming more efficient energy users. And what we do is we go back to our old habits within about four to eight weeks. The reward there is the issue and how to contain the consumer to keep effective in their energy use in the household. But all of us have different reasons uh, and various values that we base on our decisions. These could be economic, of course. They could be a way of life that is particularly green. Uh, or a multiplicity of thresholds more to do with equity in society, social inclusion, and collective altruism where we're sharing and redistributing what we have. We give away our slice of the pie. And while all of these ideas are very innovative, they're cool, they're snazzy, the connected home, automation and voice-activated environments, smart metering, and redistribution Deep down, we need to think about the next steps we are taking forward and why and how will this data that we're collecting actually be used for and against us. On the one hand, people who can afford it are bursting to technify, bursting at the seams. And these are usually young professionals uh, midway through their career as well, uh, predominantly 
a male-driven thing um, from the research I've conducted. It's like toys for the boys in some instances. And I say that without um, reservation, of course. Um, I spent hours yesterday listening to people who I could identify as DIYers in the home. And they've got video blogs to tell you about the Internet of Things and what they're doing to their home. To the extreme is people implanting themselves to have the environment respond to them as they walk around in an ambient environment. And the story on the V-blogs, doesn't matter which one you look at, goes something like this. My Google Nest's connected to my Google Home. My Google Home's connected to my Philips Hughes. My Philips Hughes are connected to my Amazon Echo. Dem Internet of Things, Internet of Things, of Things. Thank you. I've never actually sang in front of a public audience before. I'm sure you can tell that. It seems, ladies and gentlemen, some of us cannot get enough. I do get the massive revolution that will occur and is occurring before us, making our homes more energy efficient. I think that's an excellent way forward. And especially when consumers are empowered to make decisions, as we said. But the truth of the matter is, while we are going to see some very smart solutions, most of these LED-based in lighting, and if you compare them to our conventional light bulbs, we can see a change in energy. But the sensors are just going to grow and magnify lighting, image, temperature, audio, and much, much more. And these will be in everyday disposable objects. So as we scale up, are we really going to be that much more energy efficient when there are sensors embedded in absolutely everything? I want you to think what will happen to these products. Will they find their last remaining home in e-wastelands somewhere in Asia, like Bangladesh, uh, South America, or Africa? I personally do not see the point of having 60 million colors being able to transform with mood, ambience, music tone, and context, but I do love what Philip Hughes, Philip's Hue is doing. We seem to be distracted, however, by what, I call, by what I call the illusion of choice. Who really needs 60 million colors to change in ambience? Who needs to scream out an HTML tag of a particular color for it to come out in the background of your home? Or, as some people have done, different behind the bedpost of their, of their bed, different behind the kitchen lighting, different as you enter the walkway in the foyer, etc., etc. To say this is, in another way, of I've been pondering how we are preoccupied with the data and making sure we monitor human activities to determine context, and we're missing the point, ladies and gentlemen. Energy efficiency has been proven not so much to come from changes in human behavior, which are very difficult to enact over the longer term because of rewards and the novelty effect, but from better engineering design in white goods and other tools, especially in industry, that don't burn so much energy. They have a greater impact, especially industrial uh, tools and industrial robotics that indeed run 24 times 7, 365. But what about the economic costs and the maintenance costs of replacing humans with these technologies? Yes, the automated factory, but it still requires power. Perhaps what I'm alluding to here is the potential to fall into the crisis that we're actually studying not to fall into. Cambridge University has a research group dedicated to catastrophic risk, and it's all about falling into the risk that we are actually trying to grasp a better means of not falling into. So I disperse sensors everywhere in a bid to get more information from the grassroots and get this feedback loop coming back to me. I chip trees, I chip fauna, I chip fish. I kid you not, large sensors are being placed in these devices. It's this notion of having everything asleep, the sensors asleep in a near zero capacity and, and energy use, but they're aware. So that our devices are asleep, but they're aware. And I think there's much to gain from that. But while we're busy collecting the data so that the spreadsheet is beautiful, perfect, the best kinds of disruptive innovation S-curves, the market uptake, the investment outlay, uh, we're actually going to end up waiting for the perfect result and end up in the pit that we're actually waiting for the perfect result to prove. Ladies and gentlemen, we know climate change is happening. We see it every single day before us. We don't need these complex spreadsheets to tell us how far we are in to this problem. And scholars in their own field have talked about population change, fisheries issues, shortages of foods, access to grains, clean drinking water, and so much more. But we cannot eat technology, ladies and gentlemen. We can eat seeds when they develop and grow. And we cannot drink silicon. We drink clean water. 
and for the time being a great number of our global population is dying very young because they do not have access to pure water and they do not have access to food. I reflect back studying the phenomena while well, I was in high school 20 plus years ago and I still think we're struggling with the same problem. So to be guiding you today as a technologist and say keep investing in technology, it is the only thing you should be investing in, is completely bogus. Actually invest in seeds, ladies and gentlemen. Invest on human survival aspects because in the end, as Bill Gates himself said, that's what we need to survive, not so much the technology. However, the technology will help us in things like clean water, wastewater recycling methods, phosphorus, drawing that out and reusing it from waste. And there are so many things I can talk about that. Having lived through rapid change as a technologist in telecoms when we were doing $10 billion projects over 10 years in Hong Kong, back when 3G burst its bubble or started to surface, and I should say dot-com burst its bubble, not 3G, um, I noticed this notion of planned obsolescence. We were rolling out before we were even uh, creating. It was a lot of brochureware was out there. That's what we used to call it back then uh, when Nortel was competing against Cisco and other tech vendors. And I'm alluding here to our social responsibility. Yes, I can create billions of devices. I can outlay these with sensors. They can give me great feedback. But where are these IoT things going to end up? somewhere on another scrap heap with our 3G mobile phones that we change every six months or some of us every two years or as has been planned right towards the end of your plan as you need to transition, they die. Same with our laptops, same with our TVs, same with our kettles. This process has to stop and it has to do with social responsibility. I'll end here by talking about the hope that I have in near zero power radio frequency and sensor operations. And I was at a presentation by a DARPA research head in Arizona earlier in May this year who was talking about this sleep but aware context. I'm all for this, especially if it's not burning energy, but I would heed a warning. It is the first time in human history that we are trespassing the private boundary of our homes with devices that belong to service providers, not ourselves, not our families. And we are inviting the Amazon Alexas and the Google Homes to listen into our personal conversations in the name of human behavior activity monitoring, in the name of energy efficiency. And while we're talking quite innocently about our context, these devices are collecting and changing speech to text. Please do not think that this data, if used inappropriately, will not be used to create tariffs energy tariffs that look better than what you have at the moment, but are not. My concern is with trust in organizations, trust in government, trust in systems, ethically use, ethical use of technology, and the way we should go forward uh, so that we have survival of our planet with risks minimally to us in, as individuals and as households. So I leave it there and thank you for your time. If I could just ask uh, Jess to uh, introduce Super briefly, um, and we'll get into a discussion. Thanks, Alan. Uh, oh, after film, sorry. So hi, um, my name's Jess. I'm the CEO and one of the co-founders of Zuper. We're a new superannuation company that's soon to launch. Uh, and our big philosophy is helping people align their investment choices with things they care about. So um, I'm going to go through some of the, the research that we did and how we got to the point. Um, but just by way of background about me, uh, I don't come from superannuation at all. So I'm fresh to superannuation. I can probably say hand over heart that I've been in it about five months now. But prior to superannuation, um, I did work in finance disruption. So I spent six years at a, a fintech called Tyro. And during that time, I worked right through the gamut of payments all the way through to uh, uh, launching our first deposit product and then launching our first lending product, Tyro Growth Funding. And um, so I've, I've definitely seen the way that disruption ha is changing the financial landscape. And I think when I started to get my head around superannuation, I saw a lot of parallels to what I had seen happen at Tyro during my time in, in that business and how much that had changed the landscape. So so um, I kind of made the brave choice to get out of banking, um, even though it's kind of getting really exciting now in fintech, and jump into superannuation just because I did see there was a huge opportunity. What is impact investing? I think it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And we um, really went out and just started talking to people in the community. So Zoop has been a bit of a 12 month journey to get to where we actually have a finished product ready to launch. And the whole thing that came back to us about um, impact was that 
it really is different to everybody and the spectrum of impact is huge. And I think what we've seen in the past is this kind of concept of impact investing really being down the very dark green end of the spectrum. But we're now starting to, almost Katina's point, see people think about creating impact through many different verticals, not just um, clean energy, but also in agriculture, uh, in technology, so automation and robotics, um, and in health and wellness as well. So one of the really interesting pieces of research that came back when we went and talked to thousands of people within our cohort was that um, despite tech and, and clean energy in the green sector being all the rage, people are really interested in what's happening in the health and wellness sector. And I think when you go and you think about Australia as a whole and our appetite for, you know, staying fit and getting out and, um, you know, numerous, um, some millions of gym memberships and this idea that we're all very cognizant of the ageing population, that, that, that kind of doesn't surprise you when you think about some of those macro trends. So um, I like to think it's profit meets purpose and I know you hear that a lot and it's kind of like a very cliche thing, but if you do start to read a lot of the literature on millennials, um, so that kind of mid-1980s mid to, to early 2000s or just below, um, you start to understand that people are looking for performance from their investments, but they are wanting to tie those to social purpose. And there's a bit of flex between how much profit they want versus how much social performance they want. And if you can find a way of delivering that to them and tailoring it to what they want, then you can probably start to create some really interesting products. And I think for us, when we thought about that um, as a team, we realized that superannuation was a great place to start because it's a wealth product that everybody owns. And then from there, you can potentially take someone on a much bigger journey into discretionary wealth and other impact style products. So just a few stats up there, which I think are really, really interesting. Um, we spent a lot of time looking at this um, section of the market, uh, sort of high net worth millennials or, or even Henry's high earning, not rich yet. Um, but just some stats that I pulled from literature. Um, so 93% you know, of, of millennials do believe that a company's social and environmental impact is key to their investing decisions and that is growing all the time. And I think if you think about the era we're heading into, the social era, it makes a lot of sense, right? We're exposed to a lot of what's going on in the world. We're not sort of sitting at home. I'm from New Zealand and Christchurch not knowing what's happening in Bangladesh or Syria or the US. We see that every day in our social feeds. We're exposed to a lot of information. And so we want to feel that we can actually have an impact on that. And we do look at our politicians and kind of go, well, they're not really having an impact on it. So maybe I can put my money where my mouth is in a way and actually drive that. And I think you can look to other um, things that are happening in the world, such as um, the March on Washington earlier in the year. You know, women getting up and saying, and, and men, and saying, you know, it's not okay. I, I, I don't believe in that and I want to say and do something about it. So all of that, you take that macro stuff that's happening and you you can translate it into products that you can deliver people that feel like they have a voice. Um, so you can flip to the next slide. So Henry's, yes, it's a great term. I definitely laughed when I heard it as well. So <laughs> we did a lot of research into this cohort. It's not the only one that we're interested in providing services to, but it is obviously of interest to us because it does tend to show through the literature that that's where impact investing is resonating the most. So high earning, not rich yet, tend to be on salaries of over 80K, whether or not you think that's high earning, I don't know, maybe not anymore. Um, there's about 1.1 million of them in Australia. Um, they're definitely smart, they're educated, they care about certain things, um, and these are typically the trends that come out the most strongly. So absolutely they care about what's happening in clean energy, green, they're interested in social responsibility, but they are pragmatic. So you will of course get the, the people that sit at the extreme end of the spectrum, but you also get people in the middle that understand, you know, it's not all about clean energy. Maybe there's a little bit of a mix of something else in there as we move to this kind of new new world order. Um, technology, yes, people are interested in blue chip stocks, but they're very interested in emerging technology. And it's important to remember that some of the things like Facebook and Netflix and Amazon, they kind of make up, you know, your standard international equities now, right? So when people think tech, especially in the millennial sector, they're actually more likely to be thinking crypto or they're more likely to be to be thinking automation and robotics. I think that's really interesting to just stay attuned to. Um, wellness, of course, we sort of touched on that earlier. And don't forget, there's still the frugal, um, the frugal section. Next slide. Oh, I forgot I had a clicker, sorry. I'm like telling you what to do, it's awful. Um, <laughs> so what is the value proposition for Zupa? So um, I'm not going to talk about it at length because it's not what this is about. Jump on our website. But we want to start out with um, three thematic investments and one really basic um, off-the-shelf investment product that's just a growth-orientated um, asset mix. And we want to layer into that um, financial um, education and services initially through a chatbot and then building that out into an AI-powered layer. So really superannuation, fundamentally brilliant idea we should be exporting it to the world. It's one of the services we should take beyond our shores, not just our dirt. Um, and that's something that you know we're looking at. But also, um, I think we need to remember that superannuation in its current form could probably do with a bit of a product shake-up and how it's been delivered. And we can use some of the technology we have to hand to create better outcomes for Australians. Phil's turn. 
Um, so, <laughs> my name is Phil Livingston. I'm Managing Director of Redback Technologies. I've been in renewables for 15 years um, in the States. I was in the US Peace Corps, um, starting out putting in solar water pumping systems in the hinterlands of the Philippines for two and a half years, all the way through to, to today. This is my third startup. Um, and really, at Redback, what we do is we build, we started out building energy storage devices, um, really I mean, with 3D printing, um, basically building new kind of concepts on how to significantly reduce integration costs for getting systems in place. And, um, and then we kind of moved into the broader scheme of what is meaningful within this behind the meter kind of capability for, for providing energy to consumers. Um, so really the market itself sits in one of three boxes, either in uh, the, the provision of devices, think Powerwall, think um, uh, behind the meter storage related devices, IoT related control devices in the home, and then transactive related functionalities for, um, for networks, think uh, blockchain or other related technologies that sit in there. At Redback we do all of them, um, and uh, you know, rather than taking one niche of a related activity and looking at doing one thing really well, uh, the greatest benefit can be applied when leveraging transactive systems for utilities together with IoT-related networks together with storage-related devices. Um, and as an example of that, um, you know, our systems, Energy Australia is an investor behind us, um, as is, um, we'll be announcing a few more investors this week at our biggest conference of the year, which is on Wednesday, um, uh, for all energy. Um, we, we started out with an inverter manufacturer as an investor in China, um, and then brought on some sophisticated investors from Australia. EA came in, University of Queensland came in as an investor behind us as well, and we're the first technology that they've ever invested in that didn't originate from their own IP. Um, and we're now building technologies with them, with a range of their professors, with a new Redback te Technology Center that we're building, which is basically a data science-led institute on, on campus. Um, uh, together with Microsoft, uh, Springfield Land Corporation, Energy Queensland, and uh, and uh, and and some other parties. So that's pretty exciting as well, which is coming. Um, but uh, in effect, um, just to give a visualization of how these technologies can be disruptive and provide greater change and 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 capability, um, you know. Through load disaggregation, we can understand very quickly um, all the devices in a home that are being consumed just through consumption. And then from that, we can create on-bill finance functions to get smart devices that are efficient into homes. Um, those devices then can be regulated via IoT um, to be um, layered into the solar window so that they're being generated or consumed, energy is being consumed from those devices at a time when solar generation is greatest or distributed wind uh, and other related technologies are generating. Um, and that means that not only are we providing a more efficient capability, but also um, uh, a solution that is, is uh, consuming direct renewables rather than fossil from the, from the grid. Um, taking that one step further, I was in Prague last week signing uh, exclusive rights to um, Thinextra's Technologies for Australia, um, which is utilizing the Sigfox network. And the beauty of this is that um, we have the ability now at less than one-tenth the cost of uh, 3G, 4G LTE uh, to connect to devices in the field and to do interesting scenarios like what I'll describe now, which is you can have a floaty in your, in, in, in your, in your, in your pool uh, that will identify pH levels and understand how much time your pool pump needs to run on a daily basis and then signals that to cloud uh, and then our, our cloud um, uses prediction on the basis, today we do this on a hundred hours out on your generation and your consumption, and then we layer when that three hours should be versus the six hours that you would think that you'd have to run it and you would normally run it on a daily basis. In that scenario, you're cutting the pool pump in half as far as the consumption, which is about you know, cutting three to four kilowatt hours out of your consumption on a daily basis. And what that does is it means that that battery that you would have to size and, and expend those lithium resources and stuff like that to, to implement is no longer needed because through smart IoT, you're able to actually transact a related function. Um, just to give you an idea of how we look at the broader market and really the reason we're here today, or I'm here today to talk to you, is that we're not necessarily at the moment looking for equity, but for projects, um, we have several projects that are going on, virtual power plants going on around the country. And uh, it's thought of in storage that you know, putting a, a power plant next to a wind farm or next to a solar plant um, as far as storage is an appropriate use of that asset. But we have a very different view. 
Um, you know, uh, when you do that, all you're doing is taking care of ramping for that wind farm or that, that solar plant. And while that's beneficial for the plant, it's less beneficial more broadly. Um, companies put systems in at a market hub, and in which case you can take care of frequency um, for the, 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 the market operator. Um, and you can provi provide ramping, um, and, and I guess that's of greater benefit. Um, putting storage near a substation is of even greater benefit because you can provide voltage-related functions on a substation basis while providing ramping, while providing frequency-related functionalities, and I guess that's somewhat beneficial. But behind the meter, which is where we operate, not only can you do all of the above, but you have the greatest arbitrage capability between wholesale and retail rates, and you have the ability of transacting non-energy services. So the ability of using data science to provision lower cost insurance or other related services that the consumer agrees on the basis of a transaction on give me a lower cost of energy versus giving a greater degree of access to data so that I can transact related functionalities. The ability of transacting energy um, as well as other services. And in, in the future, we see this as our greatest promise. It's what's attracting the greatest pull from investors. Um, and, and we have new technologies coming to market uh, over the next few quarters that will allow us to provide many of the same benefits from, from the storage standpoint uh, via IoT benefits, but rather than at a $10,000 ticket price, at a well sub, sub $100 ticket price, they can go out to market and, and help networks energy retailers and consumers to be more self-empowered and to have lower cost energy solutions. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Phil, and Jess and Jess and Katina. Um, uh, so to just to kick off, kick off the discussion, perhaps um, I, I just raised what I think is um, a striking kind of element of the modern world, which is uh, well, what I think of as the fall and rise of institutions. Um, so, in a way, Facebook and Google and Amazon and so on, which are the new great institutions of our time, actually enable deinstitutionalization. in a way. So, it's a sort of a combination of deinstitutionalization and the rise of new ones. But, but uh, the, uh, the reason for sort of saying that is to focus, to, to direct the question at Phil. So how much of um, the new energy world do you think will be decentralised? Well, when, when, you, when you look at your business plan for five to ten years, what's the size of your, what's the size of your deinstitutionalised marketplace? So um, you, you definitely pick the right time zone, five to ten years. Um, so in the next five to ten years, firstly, the energy retailer as we know it is gone, right? Fully disintermediated by software. Um, so gone. Gone, yeah. So, so in, 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 in five to ten years, it's going to be very hard for an energy retailer, in my opinion, to exist, given the disintermediation of where software is today and where it's going. Um, you, you'll have a direct connection in some way with the DNSP, which is the poles and wires company. It's why the poles and wires companies are reaching out and trying to reach out with um, non-regulated energy service companies to try to somehow feed their fingers down into, into what it means to engage with a consumer. And, and what you're seeing uh, from that standpoint is that that's the loss they don't have. The retailer has this great relationship with consumers, and the DNSP has no ability to have that because all they've been doing is providing power via power line to your home, but not create a transactive relationship with but you. Why don't why won't the retailers uh, m maintain their relationship with consumers? Well, what what power do they have really? I mean, at the end of the day, they're selling vanilla flavored electrons, right? So, and and oh, I mean, let, let's let, let's be frank about it. I mean, like fundamentally, you have. Every retailer, in effect, that's a pure retailer, not a gen tailor that has a generator as well, but even that's ring fence. So those generators have to compete against each other into the market, and the retailers have to buy, and the natural monopoly technology that sits in the middle is, is not something you're going to replicate more wires right down streets. So, so th that, that retailer um, is having to sell those vanilla electrons, and if those vanilla electrons can be provided by an app, you know, with a smart app or something on those lines that allows somebody to connect to that at a much lower cost, uh, then, then they'll do that. And yes, the retailers will try to buy in for that, but they've got their own issues with how they're going to, you know, reduce manpower and change track from their existing track of providing, you know, a non-disruptive um, technology to market. So where do I see it? I, personally, I think that um, given what we've noted here, that the significant majority of homes will have their own generation 
and their own consumption. And our average customer today, with better prices where they are today, not in five to 10 years, today, 75% in excess of 75% self-consuming. So that means that you know, with the DNSPs or retailers providing now 25% of the energy that can be transacted, or you, know, you look at peer-to-peer -peer models like blockchain, you're gonna be transacting 25% of the energy. And anybody in their right mind is gonna get solar because it's the lowest cost of energy generation. So you creating a peer-to-peer -peer transactive capability between two neighbors in solar power daytime is like selling water in a flood. There's no purpose that you would buy it from your neighbor if you're generating it yourself. So fundamentally, this market is about to get very much shaken up, and, and where we are betting is that consumers, no matter what, at the end of the day, will be significantly empowered by this. And, and we see our business model flourishing quite well, not only in this market, Australia will be the first, but there are some other great markets that will follow. Jess, what do you think about, about this? I mean, how do you think about impact investing in this world? I mean, what do you think millennials will want to invest in is it just going to be solar on the roof of their own ho houses, or are they going to? I mean, are they, are they actually going to be vehicles, places to to invest in? So when you look at assuming they own a house, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> when you look at impact investing, you read a lot of the studies around it. When people have gone out, researchers and have spoken to millennials, one of the big things is um, people don't understand the space enough, and they don't know where to get education from. But when they do get to that point of understanding and realising what's possible, then they want to have a big part in co-creating what they impact invest in. It's very personal to them. And I think that comes out of a whole bunch of other services that we use today where we feel like we are co-creators. And I think, to your point, Alan, of some of those platforms you described yesterday, they, they are what have driven that, right? We all feel like we create this world around us through the apps that we use and it's very personalised and customised to us. And to your point about... Um, you know, these institutions being disintermediated by these new platforms. For me, the key word that I think we need to bear in mind, especially if we are from one of the big institutions, is this word relevance. How relevant are you to your customers? And I think that's one of the big problems that institutions face, um, from banking all the way through to superannuation, is that you're just not relevant and you haven't worked hard enough to maintain your relevance with your customer. And that's a very dangerous place to be, because when we went out and spoke to a lot of um, people about, you know, what, what would it take to get them to switch providers? Is, you could put impact investing to a side, you could put anything. The question was, if you asked me to switch, I'd probably just do it because I have no particular affinity or loyalty to my brand. You know, the big banks, for example, are all just various shades of the same vanilla. vanilla. So um, I think relevance is really important. You need to be relevant to your customers. You need to create ways to be relevant. And I think to, the, to your point about retail platforms, they don't feel relevant to me either, but a battery potentially in my home or my own gen generating power myself feels more relevant. So I think that's going to be the big challenge um, for the incumbents versus the disruptors. I don't think it's impossible to earn back your relevance, but I think that is the tricky, tricky way, tricky thing to navigate. And my final uh, question before going to you is, at Katina, now you talked about data, I think, and privacy and so on. In 1999, which is a long time ago now, Scott McNeely of Sun Microsystems said, privacy is dead, get over it. And it's deader now, is it not? <laughs> I mean, he was right and it's, it's true. And don't we just have to get over it? I, I would say privacy is not dead. It's dead when I know what you're thinking right this second. And we're not far from that. Um, I've had people at conferences I've hosted uh, looking at measuring brainwaves, uh, whether they're feeling in a good or bad mood. Mood. So imagine in the future, you know, we're wearing some kind of wearable muse device like a headband or sunglasses that is measuring through some electrode or multiple electrodes your feelings. And so you walk into a store to buy something and your electrodes tell the shopkeeper already what you're feeling. Um, once we get to that point, and I think, Alan, we're close to the surveillance occurring in the home. We call it monitoring, right? In IoT world, we call it monitoring human behavior. And Google Nest has some great ads out there in commercials. They're actually telling you they're monitoring you, but they're saying it in a ha-ha way. Like, guess what, you guys? You are so dumb that you're inviting these Google Home into your home and your Google Nest, and you know we're looking at everything you're doing. How great is the world? Alexa, what do you think? You know, Alexa, spell cantaloupe for me. Alexa, did you hear that conversation in the corner? Um, and, and so we're, it, it's like those um, Twilight um, movies, you know, where the vampire is about to reveal or the, the female protagonist senses it's a vampire and she says, 
like something like, you know, I know who you are, you know, kiss me anyway and kill me anyway, you know. I think, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> we're, we're, we're at a point where we are doing that with the invitation of these IoT hyper-connected devices. We're even talking about heart pacemakers and brain pacemakers being interconnected. And I think there is a place for connectivity, but I think there is also a place where we l allow ourselves to be protected. And whether that's us keeping the data somewhere like in our home or in some kind of container or in some kind of data center that we trust, um, that's really important. You need to think about human activity and the home. So when I know what you are doing individually in your homes, and people can go to me, retailers don't care, they just care about aggregated data. No, 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 law enforcement cares. And if you've got nothing to hide, don't worry then. If law enforcement knows everything too at a, at a press of a button, well, actually, things can happen with false positives and false negatives. And when I know what you're thinking right this moment, and I know what's going in your, on in your household, even the speech to text, we had Hello Barbie, a Mattel product, being launched not so long ago, that could hear conversations and sending back to base the child's conversations with the toy and with its siblings and with its parents back to toy talk. And when consumers caught whiff of it, of course toy talk said, you know, we won't do that again. Smack on the back of the wrist. Well, Google Home is doing it. I'm not saying they're listening into your conversations for the reason of selling you more AdWords that are more relevant to you and your Gmail accounts, but I'm saying we have the propensity to go down that place. So when I know what you're thinking and I know what's going in your household, then privacy is dead, but privacy is not dead at this point. There you go. Okay, um, so your turn. If any questions from the audience? Tons of them. We've, we're way over already, but anyway, the first, first arm that came up was here. Can we get a microphone? I'll, no. I'll just take a question. Oh, you go. Okay, sorry. Um, you're next. This one's for Jessica. The mic is dropping in now. So I'm a Henry in the um, pre... FHB uh, demographic, that is, I don't own a home and I hope I will, maybe, one day. <laughs> anyway, um, so charismatic, uh, thematic, impact investing. Given where I'm at, I have, you know, substantial financial freedom. I'm not locked into a home loan. I'm, I can choose between super funds. Where does your value alignment with picking these, you know, charismatic, thematic investments sit with sustainable, sustainable long-term strategy. So you're going to invest money for the long-term in super. So how are you balancing thematics and then long-term sustainability and returns? So the way that we do that is by keeping the thematics to a defined portion of the overall asset allocation. So at the moment, that is a self-direction of 20% of your entire superannuation pool of funds can be put towards a thematic. Now that may grow in time or it may decrease depending on what you want your exposure to be and what your expectations of your long-term horizon are in terms of the risk that you want to take. So I think that's something that we'll play with. We're very conscious of having something to take to market that we feel from all our research meets the market where we think it's at, but we really don't know. So when we get into market, we, are, we expect there'll be a lot of iterations of that product going forward as people like you and others come back to us and say, that's too much concentration or that's not enough. So so, you know, that's particularly where we'll hit on that on that stretch. From a socially responsible perspective, we actually worked really hard to try and make the core growth fun. So if you're in a thematic of 20%, but you want to have the, and the other 80% is just in a core asset allocation across growth, is there a way that we can make that um, as responsible as possible, but keep the fees down as much as we can? So we took a... Um, an index and ETF approach to constructing the portfolios and then really just went to the market and to the product pr providers to try and find things that we could swap in and out to meet those sort of ESG type um, requirements. So products like BetaShares and Russell and, and some BlackRock products. So um, I, I don't know if that answers your question, but to the property piece, um, I think it's really interesting. So out of the, the three thematics that I showed you then, the next ones that came up really strongly from our research was agriculture. I want exposure to agriculture, potentially Aussie, Aussie, Aussie agriculture. Um, and I want exposure to property, but I don't want exposure to commercial property. I actually want exposure to residential because just because I'm not in the market with a property or in a home, why can't I have some exposure to, to the residential sector? Now, whether or not now's the right time to get into that, I'm, I'm not an oracle, but, um, you know, there are... There are fintech startups out there that are doing a lot of interesting stuff in fractional property investment. And I think we have this really interesting ability to work with some of them and develop some really interesting um, one-of-a-kind thematic tilts that because we're small, because we're agile, because we want to be different, 
we can run a lot faster and do those things compared to maybe some of the bigger funds. Katina, thank you very much for, um, I, I thought it was really interesting how you challenged the notion that investing in technology and investing in innovation is the same, is not the same as long-term investing and investing for the long-term. Um, I guess that's a little bit of a reflection of the private equity industry and maybe how disconnected it is from problems of the world. So some investors are currently considering using the sustainable development goals as a framework for allocating capital. But from a technology perspective, is that the most efficient way of picking the winners and losers uh, in terms of from a technology, in terms of new technology? I think it's a great question. I think if we can fuse those two aspects together, um, I was at a presentation by Andrula Caminera, uh, who studied at Andrews University, who's the outreach um, executive person uh, within the Sustainable Goals area in the EC. And she was talking about how do we empower developing nations towards sustainability, but also give them this to empower them in farming, to empower them uh, while they're on the field, to empower them to make payments, to empower, empower them to save. And so how can we sort of build a matrix that fuses these things together. I think it is the right approach to think about the sustainable goals. Um, I think it is also the right approach to think about how technology can empower um, developing nations, but I caution here. I feel very uh, frustrated, is the word, when I see magnates in the tech industry flying to places in India holding laptops as if the one laptop per child is gonna save the world. Actually, it's much deeper. And while we can have nice pages at the front of The Economist and nice pages in the front of Time and it looks nice for Zuckerberg to be there, it's great. I'm glad he's caring about it. I'm absolutely happy Bill and Melinda Gates have these foundation funds for these nations where we're doing research to help people in that sector and in, in that living standard and quality of life. But we mustn't patronise and say so it has to be real. And these are long-term. These are not Kickstarter funds, you know, let's raise $3 million by tomorrow. This is long-term planning, and I think at the moment we're being distracted. It's very easy to be distracted because of greed, and we all know how difficult it is to make those balance sheets work and to make right investments for the people we're responsible for, for the shares. But I go back even to the previous panel, was it Oz Ethics? There has to be some ethical foundation for what we're doing in the longer term. And no wonder the millennials, as Jess said, are so preoccupied with sustainability, environment, tech, all three together um, will work. But if we go solar, and I think retrofitting is, I love all of Phil's point, it is about software, it is about solar, it is about retrofitting buildings, but what is the side effect of going solar? Is there any waste? And how do we measure that waste? Um, but it is definitely one way to go. Um, so I'm just going to say let's merge those principles together and let's try and do something not just for our generation or the next generation. What's going to happen in 200 years? Okay, longer term. And our spreadsheets basically only let us think beyond three months. You know, I remember doing business cases at Nortel um, in pre-sales engineering and it used to be 25 years payback periods, right, for 2G networks, 3G supposedly we're going to give us more ARPU, average revenue per user, and we were to boost that and make it maybe 12 and a half years, as some people in Sunday Telecom told me when I was presenting to CFOs. Now we look at three months, six months, 12 months. We have such a short vision, and it's dictated by money. It's dictated by our finances. How do we overcome those, your due diligence is for 12 months, and maybe your due diligence is for two years, and how do we think a little bit further when our spreadsheets restrain us and our tools and products that actually quantify the future for us, but qualify. So, so I go back, I was going to present something on um, uh, uh, one of the New Testament quotes from Luke, which came to mind, you know, we can see when there's a cloud, we say, oh, look, it's going to rain. And then we see there's wind and it's going to be really sunny or something like that. Um, but how come we can't interpret the times and we're losing our intuition because we're basing everything on data-driven decisions and I get it, evidence-based everything is the slice of life at the moment. I agree with that approach. <laughs> but we're losing our ability to qualify. We don't need to look too far away after all these human disasters, man-made disasters, and also natural disasters to say that something is wrong with the climate. And I'm not being a doomsday, I'm just saying we can slow this climate change process down if we look beyond just the three-month spreadsheet into the longer term. 
Have we got time for... Oh, I'm getting uh, the wind up there. That was it. <laughs> uh, well, please join me in thanking our wonderful panel today. It's been great.